Good evening and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. Thank you for joining us tonight's event, Is War on the Way Out? Before we begin, please note the exit doors which are located on the park side and the John F. Kennedy Street side of the auditorium. In the event of an emergency, please walk, do not run, to the exit closest to you. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. If you are on Twitter tonight, Join the conversation with hashtag war, which you'll also find listed on your program. Please take your seats now. Thank you and enjoy the program. Good evening, I'm Joe Nye, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this forum. Uh, this is a uh, uh, topic tonight which some of you might say is absurd, uh, or that has a, we'll have a very short forum because the question you are asking is war on the way out, and you will say, I picked up my paper this morning, or I listened to NPR on my way here, and I noticed, uh, and then you can give your own list. You can go through Afghanistan, or you can do, you can do today's events in Syria. I mean, you can, you know, wouldn't take us very long. So you may say this, this will be a very brief forum. But in fact, what we have tonight is two extremely interesting presentations of the case that indeed war is on the way out. And uh, we're going to hear the case for that from people who've written these two books, which I will hold up as proper props. Uh, Joshua Goldstein's Winning the War on War, The Decline of Armed Conflict Worldwide, and Steven Pinker's The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined. And then we're going to have two of our Kennedy School experts, uh, Monica Toft and Stephen Walt, who are going to react to that. Now, let me say a quick word on who the cast of characters is, but I'll keep it very quick since you have in your in the little brochure here uh, more than uh, the information I'll convey. But uh, Joshua Goldstein is a professor at American University and research scholar at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst and uh, author of a number of important books in international relations. And Steven Pinker is the Harvard College Professor of Psychology here at the university, and uh, is also sometimes known as a social science rock star, all sorts of great awards that he's won. And his book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, is merely the latest of a variety of very interesting books um, that uh, I recommend to you. Monica Tuft, who is to uh, Stephen's left, uh, is our colleague here at the Kennedy School and a leading authority on uh, civil wars, as well as a leading authority on religion and international affairs. And Monica, you just published a book last year, so say the title. God Century Resurgent Religion and Global Politics. Right. God Century Resurgent Religion and Global Politics. And Stephen Walt, who's going to anchor my left wing, but your right wing, uh, is a former academic dean here at the Kennedy School and um, a leading theorist uh, of international relations, but also a leading blogger on the foreign policy blog site. And that ability to combine uh, theoretical elegance, 
and status in the field with an ability to mix it up with the toughest of tough <laughs> current Washington types is rare and uh, much to be commended. So we're lucky to have uh, such a panel with us. In any case, uh, rather than my going on much about this, um, I'm just going to say that having read these books, I found them really quite extraordinary. And uh, the argument that uh, uh, if you think about it, that this change in the role of violence, if our panelists agree that it has indeed occurred, uh, may be one of the most important things that has been going on in the world. And what's interesting in particular about the arguments in these books, I think, is that uh, they make a pretty good case based on the numbers. These are not utopian books. They're books that are quite factual, that uh, indeed takes a long time to read them. Uh, but I recommend it anyway. There is, it's a lot there worth reading. But they do lead you, I think, as Steven Pinker says in, uh, in the introduction or preface to his book, if you read this and understand it, you get a very different idea of what modernity is. And uh, that's a pretty big statement and a pretty big reason to read these two books. So the fact that they're not utopian books, that they're grounded on data, and that they come to these enormous conclusions about who we are and the prospects of our current period, makes this a, maybe a more interesting forum than I first thought when I said that the newspapers would dismiss us all in, in uh, short order. So let me turn first to Joshua on my left. We'll go down the, the row uh, and say, I think it's in the beginning or near the beginning of your book that you say humans are not peaceful by nature. If so, then why has war declined? Well. Human beings started out in prehistoric times extremely violent. And we didn't think this when I was going to college, mm -hmm. um, but evidence has accumulated since then. I spent one whole afternoon on the American Anthropological Association panel where I was a discussant. They were just discussing the digs in North America pre-Columbian times, and one after the other after the other. Massacre sites, um, you know, mass graves, atrocities. Um, Prehistoric humans were extremely violent. Um, since then, we've had good centuries and bad centuries. But um, in my opinion, uh, after World War II, we did something new, something we tried before World War II, and it didn't work um, in the League of Nations. We founded the United Nations. All the countries belong to it this time. It's got um, norms in the charter that are not universally followed, but generally um, govern relations. And we've developed this tool, peacekeeping, along with other tools that the UN has, that has successively, progressively, over a number of years, um, made it possible to resolve more conflicts without violence, to s reduce violence when it has already occurred, and to sustain peace when you're able to negotiate a peace agreement. So I see this as a critical element of why we're becoming more peaceful. Now, there are other causes, and my other two top ones are, um, number one, that uh, norms have changed, which was more Professor Pinker's um, you know, long-term argument. We're becoming less violent in our, our attitudes towards war. And, and second, that trade and prosperity. Trade is now the basis of prosperity where conquering land used to be. So you could conquer land and the economy was based on agriculture, um, you'd get rich that way. Now it doesn't work that way. You trade to get rich, war doesn't work for that. So the economy is changing, the norms are changing, and most importantly, in my view, the international community, it's not an oxymoron international community, it really works. Now let me, before I turn to Steve Pinker, let me press you one step further on something which you do, I think, address, but I think others ought to hear it. Any times people say that, um, the trends are down, violence is down. They always are followed by somebody else trotting out the name of Norman Angel, who wrote a very famous work in uh, 1910, I guess it was, saying essentially it's over. You know, the last big war we had in Europe was the Napoleonic Wars. We, Bismarck had a few nice little scraps in between, but 
you know, we, so we had this long piece, there was a view that now war was impossible, it was too costly, and of course this was on the eve of the enormous conflagration of World War I. So what do you say to those skeptics who say that you're just the new Norman Angel? You're just, you know, give us a few more years and you'll be like Norman Angel. People say, you remember Joshua Goldstein? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not the first time I've heard this argument. And in fact, there could be another terrible war. I'm the first to say um, there's no guarantee that this trend will continue. That's different than saying the trend doesn't exist. You know? So um, right now, we have a favorable trend going, and I think it could continue. I believe that our actions today will determine whether it does continue. Now, what Angel really said was that a war would be suicidal and stupid not necessarily that it wouldn't occur, and it was suicidal and, st and stupid. So, I mean, he was right in that sense. But, in fact, there was a period there before World War I where things had been relatively peaceful in Europe, not so much um, the 19th century and some other parts of the world, not so much. Um, and, uh, and those hopes were dashed. Now, does that mean that all hopes will be dashed every time we have the possibility of a more peaceful period? No. I mean, that would be saying because the League of Nations failed, the UN can't ever work. Or because Apple computers failed with the Newton, they would never be able to build a tablet computer that was successful. And we know this isn't true. Um, so the fact that uh, we fell into these terrible world wars a century ago doesn't mean that we're doomed to repeat that over and over again. Could, but we're not doomed to. Steve, let me turn to you on the, and your book actually goes Josh one further by saying not only is war on the way out, violence is on the way out. That's a really extraordinary statement. And uh, yet you have enormous amounts of data in there uh, to support your case. I think at one point you say that there are 60 different uh, uh, charts and graphs with numbers in them. And, and uh, uh, if it's so clear that you can put it in 60 charts, uh, why hasn't it been noticed? I mean, there are some social scientists yes. who notice it, but, but, you know, why are people, usually when you say this, they say, oh, come on, get serious. Yeah. Well, violence <coughs> has not gone down to zero, and um, it may never go down to zero, although it can keep getting lower and lower. And there are always enough violent events to fill the evening news. Uh, it's a property of the human mind that we estimate risk by memorable examples. And so if a scene of carnage and um, cars blowing up uh, is in memory, uh, as it will if you see it in, in uh, living color, and nowadays anyone with a cell phone can broadcast live coverage of carnage wherever it does occur, then our estimate of the risk will be out of touch with the statistics. And indeed, this is a, it's just a quirk of human estimation of probability uh, that constantly confronts me and, and uh, Joshua when people say, well, what about Syria and what about Libya and what about uh, this place or that place? And of course, the fallacy is that uh, what those confirm is that rates of violence haven't gone down to zero, but they consist of picking post hoc those events that still persist and using it as representative of an overall trend. And the only way to measure an overall trend is to measure a uh, proportion, in fact, to measure proportions over several points in time. And the human mind doesn't naturally do that. Social scientists ought to. There is a wonderful uh, uh, chart in there which was uh, backed up by some work that had been done with, by archaeologists. I think it made the case that uh, in, before, when we were living as hunter-gatherers, so before we were under the Hobbesian Leviathan state, that, uh, which comes with agriculture and after, that one out of four males died by violence? Is, is that, or I remember, do I remember that yeah. number correctly? Yeah, there's, there's quite a range of variation from, uh, but it, uh, I estimate the average is about 15% of people of both sexes, and uh, a, large, a larger percentage of them are, are uh, men. So mm -hmm. it's, it's not a bad summary, although the societies for which we have data range from 0% to 60%. Mm -hmm. yeah. I th you have uh, a very nice uh, uh, little uh, summary uh, at the end of the book about the uh, five major causes of why this has happened. Maybe you could just sort of quickly, for the sake of the audience, summarize yeah. those. 
Yes, so I, I try to uh, I ask the question, is there anything in common among six historical declines of violence, of which the um, diminution of interstate war and great power war following 1945 is one, and then the more recent decline in, world, uh, in war worldwide is another. But others include the uh, transition from hunter-gatherer rates of uh, tribal raiding and feuding that uh, both Joshua and Joe have mentioned to the lower rates under state control, the abolition of institutionalized forms of violence and cruelty, such as uh, mutilation as a form of punishment, institutionalized slavery, debtors' prisons, blood sports, dueling, and so on. And then finally, the more recent uh, targeting of um, violence on smaller scales, such as lynching, uh, domestic violence, violence against children as well. And one other is the decline in homicide in uh, European countries since the Middle Ages, which has fallen by a, a factor of about 35. So do any of do, uh, are there uh, causes that span these six different historical declines? Well, I suggest there are a number of them. One of them is that Hobbes got it right when he suggested that a uh, Leviathan, uh, or what the extent to which we have an international equivalent, say the United Nations and other internet governmental organizations, third parties tend to ramp down rates of violence, both by changing the incentive structure, that is, penalizing uh, aggressors, and also, therefore, absolving both sides of the need to uh, establish a reputation for toughness to deter their adversaries, to the extent their adversaries are deterred by a third party. Uh, I think changes in uh, the economic incentives toward trade and exchange have uh, reduced the temptations to plunder, if it's cheaper to buy something than to steal it. If other people are more valuable alive than dead, then that changes the incentive structure. I think there are also psychological changes that, uh, uh, that operate through cosmopolitanism and literacy, that it's harder to demonize others and to maintain a tribal value system when uh, you read first-person accounts of what it's like to be someone from a formerly demonized tribe. Uh, as, you are, uh, as you consume history, as you consume, consume journalism, it's uh, increasingly harder to maintain that your own tribe is uh, always pure, always right, always justified, and moreover is the only uh, group that has the ability uh, to, to uh, suffer. So uh, an expansion of uh, empathy and the consideration of, uh, of others. Finally, I think the uh, advances in education and literacy, in um, uh, open debate, in uh, exchange of ideas, has increasingly allowed people to set up the problem of violence as something to be solved, something that we can throw our wits against. And rather than seeing every contest as a zero-sum game that we have to win at all costs, we think, how can we and the other guy both step outside this, come up with proactive arrangements that will uh, make violence less tempting for both of us simultaneously, therefore solving the problem that the unilateral pacifist is, uh, is a sitting duck. And I think across a, a, a range of kinds of violence, you can see human ingenuity slowly and gradually chipping away at these problems in the same way that we've attacked other scourges of the human condition like d disease and famine. Monica, you are an expert on how people kill each other in civil wars mm -hmm. and also how people kill each other in the name of God. Mm -hmm. um, what do you make of this argument? Uh, well, first of all, I. I I really want to commend both Joshua and Stephen for really terrific books. Um, you know, as a student of violence and war, uh, one of the things that we face is, is that, especially in the academy, but I think, you know, writ large policy making, that sort of thing, is that it tends to be stovepipes. So you have psychologists who study individual motivations for violence, maybe proclivities towards suicidal thoughts. And then you have criminologists and sociologists who study societal problems criminology, you know, uh, interpersonal violence, uh, domestic abuse. And then you have political scientists, Steve and I and Joe are political scientists and Joshua is too, uh, who study sort of societal political, and looking at elites and masses and why societies sort of get involved in revolutions, coups, and then of course wars. And so what these two volumes, and in particular Stephen's book does, is it provides sort of a corrective that actually there's a continuum of violence. Uh, one of my, what I would like to see more actually uh, from the book,
um, uh, despite all the great data, is sort of the drawing of the connections between the interpersonal violence uh, and the societal and the political kinds of violence. So for example, you have a nice discussion about Hitler and how he was sort of a depraved individual. But the question is, is then, OK, I can accept that he was a necessary condition for violence and bringing Germany to state and the world on the brink um, um, of you know, total annihilation. Uh, how did he motivate the German population writ large? So he wasn't a sufficient condition. And so I think there's a lot of work to be done. So I commend you. But I think now we have to take that next step and sort of tease out across uh, the different levels of analysis and the different levels of data. Um, where I really want to challenge both of them, actually, is on where sort of the trends are and whether they're historical um, uh, and how historical, global, and then teleological. And I know that both of you say that you understand that you're optimists. You say, I'm an optimist. I have to write this. But you know, as somebody, you know, who, who would have imagined in 1948 that Nazism today would still be alive? It is. I study Russia, the Soviet Union, and you know, skinheads, and they still don't like a lot of their population. And they create a lot of havoc for the Russian state to have to deal with. Uh, so one of the things that when I was reading the book was uh, it just seemed that most of the data were derived from the European experience. Now, you do have data that go to China. We, we can talk about the Mughals and in, uh, India and other corners beyond Europe, but uh, who's Somebody who's in the business of also counting bodies, unfortunately, and assessing censuses and the like, um, I qu simply question the precision with which some, if not all, of the data are presented uh, and how confident you are. And you actually do a nice job saying, look, the trends are there that even if we're off by a margin of 10, but I, I question whether we can even be as accurate as a margin of 10 with some of these data. And I think about the Rwandan genocide, which just happened in 1994. This was a highly functional state that knew exactly where everybody lived, which is why that genocide was as good as it as it was, if you want to think in those perverted terms. But we still don't know how many died. The range is anywhere from 500,000 to a million. And so there you have this huge variation. Uh, the data for violence more generally, not war, and Stephen, this is sort of your book. Uh, and the declines in the most recent period, which you call the long piece for the post-World War II and the new piece for the post-Cold War, uh, for me are even more suspect, suspect in the terms of their trans-historical, trans um, uh, global nature, because those 60 charts that Joe talked about, many of them were derived from the US. Most of the criminal charts were US and um, um, that sort of thing, and or Europe. And so you look at murder rates and stuff on Europe. And so one of my questions as an international relations scholar is, is are we explaining the European experience and sort of the Euro European hegemony? And what's going to happen once sort of we know that most of the population uh, is now being born in the South and is living in the South, and GDP is really largely coming, we think, is coming from the East. And so as we see a shifting of sort of world power, the two big measures that we use of power and sort of what's going to determine the play of politics in the international system is GDP and populations. Um, the extent to which the data that both of you bring to bear is an artifact of sort of what we've witnessed in the last 100 years, if not 400 years since the treaties of Westphalia as a European experience. And are these norms, the data that you use to support the argument about the norms, are they really going to hold? Um, so I'd love to be optimistic, but I, I, I question whether uh, the modern era, the 21st century, is going to be as specific. I'm going to give you both a chance to reply, but um, well, actually, maybe I'll let you reply to Monica so that we don't, so that it doesn't look too much like piling on. I know Steve Walt well enough that that he will just pile on. <laughs> so Joshua, you, 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 you. so that's why they have me here. I'm to feminize the panel. That's right, exactly. <laughs> Joshua, yeah. Um, I, I would not call myself an optimist. I don't think I'm an optimist. An optimist is someone who sees things as, you know, sort of is biased towards seeing things as better than they are. A pessimist sees them as less good than they are. I'm, I'm a scientist. I'm trying to look at data. I did not expect to find this conclusion. I have a textbook in international relations that was revised for many years. It has a list of wars in progress, who's fighting where in the world, and it took me a number of years as it did those paleontologists digging up the graves to find all the peaceful people. And after a number of these skeletons with embedded projectile points, you, you change your conclusions. I discovered this list was shrinking. There were fewer wars. There were smaller wars. And I began to, to track that trend. 
as a result, not because I'm an optimist. I'm not. I'm a worrier. Um, <laughs> and I don't think that I'm particularly Eurocentric, although the whole discipline is. Um, but I'm looking at the whole world. All my data are worldwide battle deaths, um, worldwide numbers of wars. Um, I'm actually East Asia is an area of um, particular progress where there, you know, some decades ago were big wars raging and now there aren't. But actually, a number of regions, and this is a key data point, um, like Central America, the Balkans, uh, West Africa, that were just consumed with wars um, pretty recently, a year or two ago, are now completely at peace. So that's one important data point. And then the most important data point is the wars between the big regular national armies anywhere in the world. So these have been the most destructive, most lethal wars in history. You know, regular armies head to head, India versus Pakistan, Iran versus Iraq, artillery, tanks, um, airplanes, missiles, the whole thing. And um, today, nowhere in the world are two of these regular national armies fighting each other. This is new, um, I think, Stephen has some data about uh, the rate of these wars um, in Europe centuries ago, but I mean, this is a, a big new trend in the world. Nowhere are they fighting each other. The last time they did, well, Russia, Georgia for five days, 500 people killed, um, and then before that it's the Iraq, US, 2003. So I mean, it's a number of years. These armies aren't fighting each other anymore. They're still all armed to the teeth, but they're not fighting. So these are the kind of data points that are driving my conclusions, not a kind of rosy view of the world, which I really don't think I've ever had. So. Steve? Yeah. Um, I, um, like, like Joshua, I would not call myself an optimist. I say in the book that it, my attitude is more one of gratitude than optimism. And I'm the, as cynical as anyone when it comes to human nature. I'm a, I'm a Hobbesian in a field of Rousseauans. Um, <laughs> but, uh, the, uh, the, the numbers that I dealt with, and uh, like, as, as with Joshua, did have a global, global scope. I relied for war on the figures from the Peace Research Institute of Oslo and the Uppsala Conflict Data Project, both of which, and they are, they are different numbers assembled by different methodologies, but both of them show a, a downward trend, uh, and a dramatic one. If you, um, the numbers that I cite that Joshua and I uh, repeated in our recent um, uh, article are that at the, the worst years of World War II, probably a rate of uh, battle deaths of about 300 per 100,000 per year. You might say, well, of course, you're starting from, from the peak. Uh, but on the other hand, there are a number of people, and I have the quotes, uh, a number of experts in history and international relations who said in the decade after, a couple of decades after World War II, well, that's just a, a warm up for World War III, and you ain't seen nothing yet. This is, this is the welcome to uh, the new normal. So, uh, even starting with World War II and, and noting that we have not hit that peak ever since is news compared to the predictions even from the 1970s. Then around the time of the Korean War, it went from 300 down by an order of magnitude to a little less than 30 per 100,000 per year. The years of Vietnam, it was in the teens. The years of the, say, 70s and 80s, it was in the single digits. And for the last um, a decade or so, so or maybe eight, eight years, it's been less than one per 100,000 per year, which is less than the rate of homicide in any country, less than the rate of death from all kinds of, of uh, causes. So even if those numbers are off by uh, a lot, there's just no question as to what the direction is. And granted, it's not a smooth curve. There are lots of bumps and scallops. But, uh, but you can't miss the trend line. And then uh, I like to do sanity checks against numbers because um, even though I believe that no one should have the right to use the word more or less unless they can produce some numbers, uh, but still you also want qualitative assessments to, uh, to show, to, to do a sanity check to make sure that your numbers aren't way off. And I was struck by the number of military histories that I read without a single number in them. Where the historic, like John Keegan, uh, the, the distinguished military historian who just said, something weird happened after 1945. This is the world that we're living in now is not the world that I've been chronicling for the past several thousands of years. And I have an, about half a dozen military histories that all make the same observation based qualitatively, not just on, well, not on body counts because they don't cite them, but just on the way that national leaders think, the options that are on the table, typical responses to provocations, the, the qualitative difference was noticeable to them, and I think that jibes with the, the body counts. <laughs>
Oh, uh, sure, Josh. Quick okay. addition. Um, we all know there's a lot of wars still going on around the world. There's a lot of violence in the world. There's too much. As long as there's one war, it's one too many. That's not the issue here. The issue is the trend, the direction. And if I could make this analogy, if you had cancer, that would be terrible, a tragedy, and you'd be very upset about it. You'd go down to your doctor and try some treatments. Now, the question after a while of these treatments would not be, do I still have tumors? If so, my treatment isn't working. The question is, are my tumors growing or shrinking? Are we going forward or backward? And this is extremely important for getting our policies right, internationally and our domestic policies. Things like how much we spend on the military, how much we use international organizations, they depend on whether we're making progress or we're going backward. If your tumors are, are, are growing, you need a new treatment, something more radical. If they're shrinking, then you want to continue with the treatment you're on and improve it and learn from what's been working. Steve Wall. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> contrary to what you might uh, suspect based on what Joe said, I'm not going to pile on here. Uh, I think these are both terrific books, and they're both well worth the time it takes to read them. And if you see how thick they are, it's a considerable <laughs> amount of time. Uh, but they're, they're not just interesting. I can barely and, lift this. <laughs> the, 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 these are serious books. And again, you'll get a lot out of them, even if you're not persuaded by every one of the arguments. Uh, so what I want to do is, is poke at them a little bit, in part so you appreciate what I think are the strengths of the case, but also some of the places where it might be contested. Um, and one thing to note about both books, but especially Steve's book, is that he's covering a, a wide range of violence, not just interstate violence, not just war. And there are a lot of different explanations being thrown out. And one thing to ask is whether or not some of these explanations may help explain certain declines of violence, but have nothing to do with other declines of violence. Um, and you want to keep those, those straight. So for example, what is explaining the declining murder rate, I think is right. Basically, the creation of increasingly effective national governments that can keep order and prevent people from essentially having to take matters into their own hands. That may not have anything to do with whether or not you get a decline in interstate violence. That may be explained by some totally separate cause. And it's important to sort of keep all of the different possible causes and possible data trends uh, separate. Um, second, I think the claim at the level of interstate violence that the world is getting substantially more peaceful does hinge very much on how you interpret the, the post-1945 period. Because certainly the first half of the 20th century is not something you'd put up on your poster child for declining interstate violence. Right? World War I, World War II together killing about 80 million people and a number of other conflicts that kill millions of people in that period as well. Now, there have been conflicts since 1945, but nothing at that level of magnitude. And this raises the interesting question of why that's the case. What has explained what appears to be a sharp discontinuity that was just alluded to between the pre-1945 period, where great powers with lots of industrial capacity went at each other with mass armies, and eventually, at the end of World War II, the United States with nuclear weapons, what explains the absence of a serious bloodletting like that ever since. And of course, Joshua's explanation is, well, it's the United Nations, emerging set of norms. I'd argue there's at least two other causes that we might want to point to. One is the fact that nuclear weapons did exist, and more than one country had them. Right? And so nuclear deterrence may have played a role in, for example, preventing mass violence between the United States and Soviet Union for four decades. Two countries that didn't like each other very much had enormous industrial capacity, had soldiers staring at each other across borders in a number of places, and yet never actually crossed the threshold to direct violence. Did nuclear weapons have something to do with that? I think it probably did. But the prescription you might draw from that, oh, well, let's give everybody nuclear weapons, might not be the policy conclusion you would draw. Second point, in much of uh, Steve's book in particular, there is the argument that human behavior, in some respects, is fundamentally changing as a result of reason, as a result of new norms emerging, possibly even changing in the way we process information. And here, I, I think one wants to at least poke a little bit at that as an explanation for all of it. For example, there's a fascinating discussion of changes in personal behavior that we became, uh, or societies, particularly in Europe, became more civil, uh, personal conduct. Uh, people started uh, confining more activities to private chambers rather than engaging them in public. 
uh, engaging in fu fewer impulsive acts of violence for various reasons. And, I, and it's a, both a fascinating discussion and I think largely correct. But it's not obvious to me that the civilizing instinct at the interpersonal level translates to more civilized behavior between states or between states and other peoples. So at the same time that countries in Europe were becoming more civilized in their personal conduct, they were also killing millions of people in colonies around the world without ever sort of batting an eye about it. It's not clear that more civilized behavior at court prevented people from enslaving people for a couple of centuries as well. That's more of an international relations problem, not a personal civility problem. Uh, moreover, when you think about it, the fact that someone is able to control their personal impulses more intelligent doesn't mean they will necessarily not rationally and coolly calculate that opting for violence is in the interests of the state. Think Otto von Bismarck fighting three wars leading to the unification of Germany, at, and many people would argue that those were quote unquote smart wars from the perspective of Prussia, right? But also at a period where Bismarck himself, relatively civilized guy, doesn't beat up his servants all the time, doesn't misbehave in all of the other ways that Steve talks about. Uh, one, uh, two, two final comments on this. Um, I think a cautionary moment on this particular, or a cautionary uh, element on this explanation is to ask ourselves how quickly we as humans might revert if the boundary conditions changed. So if you look at uh, Bosnia and Yugoslavia under Tito, when there is a relatively strong central state, there's lots of intermarriage, uh, lots of tolerance between Serbs and Croats. As soon as the central state falls apart and there's a little bit of rabble-rousing done by extremists, you find a reversion back to ethnic-based behavior uh, and ultimately leading to massacres like Srebrenica. I would argue you get the same thing in Iraq. Prior to the Iraq war, you got people arguing that, look, there's a sizable middle class in Iraq. There's actually high rates of literacy. Uh, distinctions between Shia and Sunni really aren't that serious for the Iraqi people. And therefore, it's going to be easy to create a stable, workable government after we remove Saddam Hussein. Sadly, that turned out not to be the case. And you got a lot of rather brutal behavior in Iraq post our occupation, post the collapse of central order. So again, I'm not an optimist either, and I worry a little bit that some of the things that look like optimistic trends in, say, how we treat these issues uh, might not be as durable if the conditions change. Uh, one final comment, and then I'll stop. And that is just, again, a sort of cautionary moment here. One of the other trends that I would argue characterizes the current situation is what one might call the democratization of mass violence, the capacity for small groups of people to do extraordinary amounts of damage. One of the reasons that you, do, you see smaller proportions of people dying is the fact is in the modern state, you don't need very many people to cause enormous amounts of harm. If you look at a Native American tribe back in the 19th century, virtually every male had to be a warrior had to be someone who was fighting, which means when you went into battle, you could easily lose most of your warriors, a large percentage. Today, a very small percentage of the US population is actually in the military, but it's a military that can go all over the world and wreak enormous violence. Or consider the fact that 19 people conducted 9-11 on a budget of about $500,000. And if you equip those 19 people with even a crude nuclear device, the amount of violence that a very small number of people with relatively little money could enact is enormous. So even though I'm persuaded by much of the data in both of these books and by some of the explanations that are offered, it's not a particularly reassuring uh, recipe, I think, for complacency or believing that we've licked the problem of either mass violence or large-scale violence enacted by very small groups of people. Thank you. Let's reverse the order of the replies. First Stephen, then Joshua, and then we'll go to the audience. So start thinking of your questions. Yeah. Well, there's much in, in uh, Stephen's uh, remarks that I agree with. Among them, that the causes of the decline of violence are, um, are, are multiple. Uh, I try my best in the final chapter to tie them all together as all of them basically changing the, the, the rules of the game from, 
um, zero sum or negative sum to more positive sum as a, my best attempt at an umbrella theory. But I agree that proximally, in terms of what immediately drove the changes, there's uh, a number of them. The most dramatic example would be uh, in any improvements in our treatment of animals, such as regulations for experiments in laboratories or the decline of blood sports or more humane farming practices, can't be explained in terms of benefits of trade and exchange. It's not as if we, we trade things with animals and they're striking a harder bargain. It's just, uh, and there's no social contract. The animals can't sit down and press their interests. That's a pure uh, uh, expression of uh, empathy and compassion and reason that, uh, uh, whereas other declines are going to have more uh, instrumental causes. That having been said, I think there are some, uh, there, there is, are, are some overlaps. For example, the, um, uh, the use of violence as an impulsive reaction to an insult is something that can occur at the interpersonal level when someone disses you in a bar and you, you pull out a knife. And I think there are equivalents at the international level. And I think we can all think of some basically impulsive wars. Uh, you can all fill in your favorite where uh, a country feels that it's been insulted and then lashes out and does something that in retrospect looks pretty stupid. This is not to deny that there aren't also purely in instrumental wars where there's a cost-benefit calculation on the part of an aggressor, but I think some wars probably overlap with the uh, impul impulsive street violence. And it's not entirely uh, impossible that a, um, an ethic of dignity, restraint, counting to 10, uh, thinking out the long-term implications could apply both for declines of international and personal violence, although perhaps at different time scales. I also completely agree that uh, moral compartmentalization, where you might have restraints against uh, interpersonal violence and cruelty within your own race, nation, tribe, and you hypocritically don't extend them to others, is a real fact of human history. And in, in fact, I argued, uh, partly following uh, the, the book by Peter Singer called The Expanding Circle, that one of the key forces toward the decline of violence historically is bringing those examples of compartmentalization to people's attention, confronting them with the hypocrisy. And many of the rights revolutions of the last 60 years have been propelled by exactly that dynamic. Martin Luther King said, I, I have a dream that the, this nation will live out the true meaning of its creed, all men are created equal. All men are created equal meant something very different in the 18th century than it did in the 1960s. And that's exactly what King pointed out. And likewise, the fact that uh, the principles that we do hold within our own national borders can't, not, can't be withheld to people in, from people in different states, people of different races, women, children, eventually uh, animals, is I think one of the, uh, the forces that um, has been, that, that gives a kind of directionality to a lot of these uh, historical changes. Thank you. Let uh, Joshua, you have a chance of reply, and then we'll turn to the audience. Great. So um, first of all, on nuclear weapons, and I, ag I agree with a lot of what you said. Um, this is something I worry about. Uh, you know, the one nuclear weapon can reverse this whole trend. Quite true, you know, and it doesn't mean it will happen, but it's something, something to worry about. I do think the invention of nuclear weapons had something to do with the fact that we didn't get World War III nuclear Armageddon. Um, something to, and that's an accomplishment, no doubt about it. Um, the, in the last 20 years, well, the last 30 years, the number of nuclear weapons has declined by three quarters worldwide. I mean, this is a huge historical trend that's gone largely unnoticed, but we're, we're dismantling these things as fast as we can. So you might think that as we're getting rid of nuclear weapons, violence would increase, but it's been the opposite. The violence has come down all the more as, as we have fewer of them. And we didn't avoid all those proxy wars um, between nuclear armed states, so they weren't, they weren't good at that. And we did almost blow up the world in, in 1962 with them. So there, there wasn't evidence then that they were really stopping us from doing that, although that did scare the hell out of the leaders on both sides, and it's, it's been better since then. The, your other point's very interesting, that when the boundary conditions change, that humans can become a lot more violent and wars can jump back out. I completely agree with that. Um, the, the Southwest African Bush people, the Kung, I don't have the little clicking sound, 
um, were touted as a peaceful society. All oh, when I was in college, you know, these were the most peaceful people who didn't know anything about war. And um, I remember going to the Human Relations Area Files uh, in New Haven some years ago and being taken in the back room and pull out a big file drawer, and there's the Kung file. And it was reports from the German-speaking anthropologists who'd been there decades earlier before the English-speaking anthropologists that we all had read. Um, and there were these uh, massacres right out of Bosnia. You know, go in, raid the place, kill everybody, smash all the babies, trash everything, and burn the place to the ground. Same people, different conditions. So I do feel that we have it in us to be violent, to make war. I think it's very deeply rooted. It's one of the reasons I'm not an optimist. Um, and, I, and the idea that any of this would be a recipe for complacency is exactly the opposite of the message I would ever want to give. Um, the fact that we're making progress means that we need to keep working. We need to work harder. We need to learn better what is working. Um, I think if we just slacked off and said, oh, everything's great, going fine, it wouldn't be going fine for much longer. So um, complacency, absolutely not. Um, but progress, yes. Uh, we have four microphones, two on the floor here, two in the balconies. Um, and uh, I'd like, before you ask a question, if you would identify yourself. And when you ask a question, if you would remember that questions are brief and they end with question marks. So please go ahead. All right. Uh, my name is Amrit. I'm in the, uh, at the law school. Um, and I actually might be an optimist. I guess that makes me in the minority. Um, I, I've, I, I thank you for being here, and I, I find um, the research that you've presented really compelling. And one thing I really like about it on, on, from both parts is that there's a, a, a significant reliance on, on data, on lots of data. Um, but that being said, in this discussion that we've heard today, I've heard a lot about the last couple decades, everything post World War II. And when you're, and I guess this is mostly for you, Professor Goldstein, um, when you're drawing data from the la from thousands, tens of thousands of years ago, how can the last 60, 70 years not be statistic statistically insignificant? Well, there are data from earlier centuries. Um, Sorokin had a big volume of uh, sociological data, including war, trying to estimate battle fatalities way back to the Greek and Roman empires. The data get worse as you go back through time. They get worse as you go further away from Europe. And they're never that good to start with. So it's one reason I'm not trying to always lead with the data, the statistical data, but kind of make this case in a multidimensional way. I had somebody once say, uh, your statistics may be right, but I, stu I don't believe your argument. You know, it's like, the, I'm not going to believe data no matter what. So you don't want to rely on data in making the case. Um, that said. We have some data from prehistoric times, from also uh, pre-state societies in more modern times, where we can estimate some death rates um, that uh, Stephen referred to. And we also have um, cases of wars and, um, and fatalities that people like Sorokin have tried to estimate. And I think you can, you can go back through time and get the big picture. Um, which um, you know, you've done more than I have, but my picture of it, because I focus mostly on the, date, the decades since World War II, my picture of it is um, going back through time, things get worse, things get worse, you get the world wars really bad. Then you have these good centuries and bad centuries. The 17th was really bad, the 18th not so much, the Mongol you know, invasions, 13th century, very, very bad, gives the 20th a run for its money. The 11th, 10th century is not so bad, and so forth. So this kind of up and down pattern. And that's what I think that our theories want to account for. And we start out very violent. We get into a long, long up and down period, and then something new after World War II. So that's how I see it. And it's not quite how you see Steve? it. But, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, using Sorokin's data and uh, updated by a number of others, um, I plot graphs, admittedly, with a huge amount of uncertainty, but we are dealing with orders of magnitude and logarithmic scales, so you're off by a factor of three. That is, actually isn't, isn't a big difference. And my, my pictures of, of uh, death from wars over the last 500 years look more or less as follows. Uh, frequency of war, oh, sorry, I should clarify that these, these are from uh, Jack Levy and their Great Power Wars. 
uh, wars with a great power on at least one side. But that's partly justified by a statistical fact about the distribution of deaths in war, namely the biggest wars account for uh, the lion's share of deaths from all wars combined, just because of the power law distribution of war. So if you look at great power wars over 500 years, basically frequency of wars goes down, uh, duration of wars goes down, uh, concentration of deadliness of wars, that is how many people can you kill per country per year, goes up until 1945 and then that comes down. You combine the three graphs, you multiply it out, and you do get this zigzag that Joshua was, was talking about, but the lowest points by far in this 500 year period are the, the last uh, 60 years. So they, they sit at the bottom of those graphs. Yes. Hi, my name is Farai Chidea and I'm a fellow at the Institute of Politics. I'm wondering if either or any of you um, have thoughts about whether climate change and the displacement it can cause through any number of factors, flooding, desertification, will inspire conflicts, particularly either within countries with diverse climates or border conflicts um, when people are fleeing a place that either does not provide food or is flooded, et cetera, in the future. Either of you want to take a leap? I think that uh, climate change in particular and other associated problems of natural resources will cause more conflicts. The question is, will they cause wars? Because um, conflicts don't have to lead to wars. And um, in my view, I hope I'm right about this, w conflicts over natural resources are less prone to turn into violent wars than other kinds of conflicts. Why? Because there's a tangible good, and it's a matter of dividing a pie. Um, once you go to war, you're destroying that pie. So, for instance, um, natural gas off the coast of Israel and Lebanon. Nobody's quite sure where the border is. There's gas on both sides. What do both those countries want? They want the gas, right? So as soon as they go to war over it, you're going to destroy all those gas uh, wells, and neither side gets it. And I think that's the character of these natural resource conflicts. The Caspian Sea was part of the Soviet Union and, and Iran on one side, and then the Soviet Union broke up and suddenly a bunch of countries, nobody knows where the border is, and tons of oil under there, right? So you'd think, oh, they're all gonna go to war for the oil. They didn't, they yelled at each other for a few years, and then they started drawing lines on the map and pumping out the oil. So I'm, I'm uh, optimistic maybe is not the right word, but uh, you know, I, I think those kinds of conflicts are not the big thing to worry about. Steve, you want to add it? You say in your book that it's not resources, it's being slighted and ideologies that are really the killers. Yeah, I've been coming to it, again, I'm not an expert in either history or international relations, but as an outsider, it's, I'm just trying to make sense of this. It's surprising how many wars, it's just not exactly clear what they were fighting about. I, in retrospect, although of course at the time they were inflamed by all kinds of emotions and ideologies, many of which seem rather, rather quaint today. Uh, and I, I would echo uh, Joshua's observation that of the statistical studies that I found that tried to correlate resource conflict at time one with civil war at time two, there isn't, uh, uh, holding all else constant, there isn't a clear correlation which would be consistent with, uh, with Joshua's observation. When you think of resource shortages and conflicts and climate change in, 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 even in recent memory, anecdotally, that the Dust Bowl in the United States in the 1930s didn't lead to a civil war, the tsunami in, in uh, uh, Southeast Asia didn't lead to a war, and I think it's likely that climate change can lead to a lot of misery, but it may not lead to the organized armed conflict of the type we call war. I, I mean, maybe it will, but maybe it won't. Just, just, if yep. I could just yep. tack on there that um, a lot of wars historically have been over borders. You know, changing borders, and sometimes that has to do with the location of natural resources. Borders have been amazingly stable in recent decades, and that's a change, that's a real shift. So we can talk more about that if you want. Mm -hmm. we go to the right balcony. Hi, um, my name is Julia Kamen, I'm a research associate here, um, and uh, it's a bit of a two-parter. Um, and I know you gentlemen did not write the title, or Mr. Me didn't write the title of this event, but is the war on the way out? Um, I know, Professor Goldstein, you've been pretty clear that what you've seen is a trend up until now, but it doesn't sound like you're saying this is a predictor of the future. So I want to get clarity on that. And if you agree, Professor Pinker, it's not a predictor of the future. And if, as you suggest, Professor Goldstein, that 
largely the, the, the amount of peace that we see today is, is conditional. What would be conditions in the future that could reverse the trend? And if it's not global warming, um, what else could it be? Um, and uh, for example, uh, financial collapse and, uh, and calamity. You want to start? Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Um, I don't see the end point here as being world peace, harmony and understanding, age of Aquarius. Um, that's not where I'm coming from. Um, I see, uh, I mentioned the book, Randy Forsberg's vision of war becoming uh, rare, small, socially frowned on, unacceptable, and that the trend could continue into the future. I'm pretty hopeful that it could continue into the future, especially if we get it right on policies, um, and that we could have half as many wars in a decade or two that we have now, and then half that. So that's, that's my view of, of the trend. I don't expect it to reverse in a big way. I think that's pretty unlikely, but is possible. So I'm not saying, oh, this is just a lull and we're going to have another big war. I think it's pretty unlikely we will. Um, but it's something to worry about and, and keep an eye on. And the policies that I think would be most useful would be to strengthen the international community, especially the United Nations, which has done a tremendous amount of good, always with too few resources. I have a long history in the book of, of UN peacekeeping as it's developed, and the recurrent theme is um, not enough people, not enough money, not enough boots, bullets, paper to write your reports on, much less armored personnel carriers and so forth. Um, with a little more money, the UN and peacekeeping could do a lot more good of the type that it's been doing recently. And just to put it in perspective, the average American household now pays about $700 per month for our military and veterans benefits. We pay about $2 a month for UN peacekeeping. And it does some things that our military can't do. And the opposite is also true. But $700 versus two, if we could double that two to four, double the funding for peacekeeping, this is my radical idea, we wouldn't go broke doing it. We wouldn't have to cut out our defense department. Um, and we would uh, do a lot of good in the world. So those are the kinds of things that could move us forward further. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree that the success of having uh, model as the optimistic scenario is, is very close to the way I see things, as opposed to war literally going, going to zero. Not that it couldn't happen, at least in the sense of interstate war, because there have been uh, some zeros that have been pleasant surprises in, in uh, human history. Um, human sacrifice, debtors' prisons, uh, Chinese foot binding, uh, legally approved slavery. There are things that have vanished from the face of the earth, and at the time, you might have been deemed a, a, a starry-eyed optimist to foresee that, that it would happen, but it did happen. So it's not out of the question, but I think the success of having is more realistic as a, at least a foreseeable option. In terms of what can go wrong, I think the thing that worries me the most are, to borrow a phrase, the, the unknown unknowns. Uh, that is, the, uh, maybe at this very moment, there's a young rising star in the Chinese political system who's nursing the idea that it's a terrible historical injustice that Taiwan continues to exist. Maybe the car dice will fall so that he gains power, he whips everyone up into the idea that Taiwan has to be reconquered. I think it's unlikely, but you multiply, and that who knows what would happen if, if, uh, if uh, China invaded Taiwan, what would the United States do? I think it's unlikely, but you can multiply the number of scenarios that are unlikely individually, collectively, we don't know how likely they are, and that could lead to mischief of a kind that it would be foolhardy to predict in detail, but worth worrying about in the aggregate. On the left balcony. Oh, sorry, Steve Walt wanted to jump in. Apologize, Steve. Well, I'll just, I'll just say this, or you could watch some of the GOP presidential debates. <laughs> <laughs> where I don't take some of what is being said there particularly seriously because we're in the primary season, but still, if you were looking for things that might were you a little bit about at least some conflict? <laughs> Hi, my name is Arturo Lisanda. I'm a sophomore at the college. Uh, you mentioned some of the causal arguments as to why violence has been reduced after World War II, like the UN, trade, and possibly nuclear weapons. And I wanted to see what, where you saw the proliferation of democracies all over the world playing a role in peacekeeping. 
democracy does have a role to play. It's part of the big picture, um, one of those causes um, that's in there. The reason it didn't make my top three list um, is mostly because of China and some other cases. But I mean, China is not a democracy, but it hasn't fought a single battle in 23 years now. Um, that's a remarkable record for a country that spent so much of its history at war, or revolution, civil war. Um, and so clearly, you don't have to be a democracy to abate uh, the use of war and violence. Um, and there are other cases like that, too. But as, as an overall trend um, and the, the regularity that democracies tend not to fight each other, and mm -hmm. so now there are more of those dyads out there, I, I think it does contribute something. Gen uh, Professor Mansbridge. And here, there may be some hope, that is to say, that we are getting success in countries by economic means, not by conquest, and possibly there's an expanding circle of empathy. These things might keep people from blowing one another up. But as, from the institutional perspective, from the perspective of the UN, or from the kinds of institutions that human beings have been able to build across the world, we haven't gotten very far in uh, reducing nuclear proliferation. And I suggest that we might be in the lull before the storm. Uh, a nuclear explosion, which is quite predictable, I think, in a, in a way, quite possible, um, could do create the context-changing situation that Steve Walt mentioned, in which um, we had been perfectly uh, fine going along after 1945 with skirmishes here and wars there and so forth. But then when people start uh, using nuclear weapons, that context might change, and human behavior might change accordingly. I wonder what you think about nuclear proliferation. You want to start? Sure. Um, I don't agree that we haven't made progress about nuclear proliferation. And again, we, the bias here is that we see the cases that are not successful, like North Korea. But we forget about the cases like Argentina and Brazil that were going to become a nuclear arms race and didn't. And there are many of those out there. The majority of the world's countries that have the ability to make nuclear weapons have decided not to do so. Some of them, like Japan, have the stockpile of plutonium, all the technical know-how. They could make nuclear weapons whenever they wanted. Now, Japan's a special case, but other countries um, that could South have decided. Africa. South gave Africa them gave them up. So, you know, and then um, nuclear explosions, even test explosions, in this, if I'm not mistaken, in this century, the only two nuclear explosions that have occurred are the two North Korean uh, tests, which were sort of anomalies. But, so people used to be testing these things all the time, you know, every month. There were dozens of them every year. Um, and so I think there's a, a, a norm taking effect here about nuclear weapons. I mean, we know there's a norm not to use them in war, and that's been solidified decades ago. But even to why test them and beginning to be why use them, why make them, why have them? A country like Iran, what's it really going to get out of having a nuclear weapon. It's not so clear that there's anything in it, and there's certainly a big downside for this. So I, th I do see some progress here as well, although um, I agree with you that if they start to be used or it starts to proliferate, this could be very bad and, and spin out of control. It, uh, there, there are two models for how um, nuclear um, escalation or even moving in that direction can proceed. There's a, and this is, I, I take this from an analysis by uh, John Mueller. A lot of people have the escalator model that you take one step and then it kind of whisks you up and there's just no way to stop it. But then there's the other model, which is the ladder, that every run you climb, you get more and more nervous and acrophobic and you really try to step back down. Mueller argues that historically, the ladder model is more accurate than the escalator model, which is one of the reasons why uh, even confrontations like 1962 uh, didn't, in fact, result in, in, uh, in World War III, that, that, in fact, world leaders, all things being equal, would probably not ru rather not blow up the world. Uh, and so the, the hypothetical question, if the nuclear taboo is breached, and if there is an explosion, will that uh, unleash Armageddon, or will it be contained in the same way that, say, the use of poison gas after World War I, even though there were a few examples where it was used, 
uh, everyone was so horrified that it, it um, uh, stayed at the level of, of a near taboo or a quasi taboo. So not to be optimistic, uh, but I don't think it's predictable that a nuclear weapon will be used, nor is it a uh, certainty that if it is used, it will escalate to uh, global con conflagration. Yes. Uh, my name is Elliot Wilson. I'm a freshman in the college. Uh, Professor Goldstein, in your first comment, you defend your statement that humans are not inherently peaceful by um, drawing up evidence that prehistoric humans were extraordinarily violent and that with um, the development of governance, this violence declined. I'm hoping that you could perhaps clarify what you mean by humans not being peaceful, so whether that is to say that humans are um, attracted to war and that the, the prehistoric humans are then more, they more manifest what is human, or whether by not peaceful you mean that humans are anything or they have competing desires that can emerge in given um, social superstructures. And then I, I guess Professor Pinker, if you could respond to his answer. Yeah. No, well, this is mostly your area. Yeah, the, so. okay. Do you want to the, 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 ma the major theme of, uh, of my book, and the reason that I chose its title, The Better Angels of Our Nature, is to uh, imply that while we do have these better angels, they don't exhaust human nature, that we have a number of impulses that to violence, which may be distinct, as, as Stephen Wall pointed out. There is violence that is simply the cold-blooded calculation of gain and to hell with the effect of it on the victims. There's also violence that is uh, an impulsive response to an insult that does not bring any gain. I think those are separate circuits in the brain. They run by different biochemistry. They're different uh, uh, parts of the central nervous system. And likewise, I think there are a number of better angels also uh, neurobiologically distinct. And that what changes over time, I, I argue, is the uh, institutions and social conditions that bring out our better angels uh, versus our, our inner demons. And so I would pinpoint the um, cause of the high amounts of, of tribal raiding and feuding in non-state societies as a, uh, as a fact that it, this was the original security dilemma or, or Hobbesian trap where there's always a temptation to attack uh, for gain and there's always the temptation to wipe the other guy out preemptively before he can wipe you out, which can just lead you to worry even more that he might take you out out of fear that you might take him out. And that what the Leviathan does is it, it tamps down that cycle of mutual fear and uh, distrust. And that there have been subsequent institutions, uh, some of them versions of the Leviathan, some of them versions of, of trade and those other forces that I mentioned, all of which uh, get people to be less likely to act out these uh, urges toward revenge, retaliation, naked greed, and predation, and so on, changing the, the, uh, the payoffs so that our better angels are more likely to prevail. The, and the big picture here is that um, when I was in college, we thought that people started out peaceful. That was our true nature. And then overlaid on that was the state, capitalism, and so forth that led to war, private property. And this is, you know, the Engels' argument um, about how war came about. Um, and that, therefore, to get to peace, you want to shed all that accumulated stuff like the state and go back to our true nature. Now, I don't believe that at all anymore, having seen a lot of evidence that it now appears that we, our original nature, if you will, is pretty violent. And that the state and capitalism and these things overlaid on it is actually tamping it down over time, not perfectly still in there, but, um, uh, but gradually um, moving that direction. I, I, I want to abuse the moderator's position by pressing Steve Pinker one step further. I thought the, what I really liked about your book was taking prisoner's dilemma and making it the pacifist dilemma. So human nature can go either way, either good or bad. And if you're in a situation where it's a kill or be killed, you, know, you can go uh, your, your, it's not your nature, it's the structure of the situation, and then you solve this by creating Hobbes' Leviathan. But internationally, there's no Leviathan. Yeah. And this gets back to Steve Walt's question, which is, what, in the absence of a Leviathan internationally, if that's been one of your, it's not your only, but it's one of your major mechanisms in your argument for the decline of violence, 
What makes you optimistic at the international level? Yeah, it's a, 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 no, I, I, I agree that's exactly the right question. And there isn't an um, a, a international equivalent of the police and the, the court system yet, although there, there is a, a kind of gradually emerging soft, fuzzy leviathan that, that Joshua writes about. There's the United Nations, which doesn't, in most cases, have any teeth. But people are motivated uh, in part by approval, status, reputation. I think one of the main findings in uh, the psychology of cooperation and in um, uh, behavioral economics is that people will pay a certain price for, uh, in every other good in life, to maintain a reputation as a trustworthy and honorable and altruistic uh, agent. This is separate from whether they really are any of those things, but it matters to people how they're perceived. And one could imagine a regime, I think there is a, a regime in, in place of uh, a, a, a soft leviathan where you don't want to, most leaders don't want to step out too far out of line and be seen as, uh, as rogues. To the extent that that exists, uh, then that the, might be the best that we can come, and short of world government, which is none of us have brought up. Uh, yes. Nita Crawford, I'm at Boston University, and um, Joshua, you and I have talked about this for many years, and I want to press you on uh, your, your data on Southwest Africa. I'm not, I think if we look deeper, you might actually be wrong. We'll do that another time. But the, the real question is about the dismissal of the, the notion of democracy. And what I think um, was really interesting about that question, what, and the way you dealt with it was, um, you talked about sort of formal democracies, the ones where you have votes. But the democratic process is a little different than that. It's argumentation, deliberation, giving evidence, uh, hoping that the force of the better argument persuades, not the force of the club and that that's a long-term process that has, uh, that, can, that in fact is what you see in these Occupy movements and elsewhere where people are saying, we don't need uh, to, uh, to confront as people did in the early um, uh, 20th century, the Leviathan with sticks. So I just would like to press you, and I know you're, you're working on this too, that to, to talk more specifically about that democratic process in a richer way, not to, to I wonder if, if what's really going on is something like that. Well, the first thing I want to do is thank you for your work on um, changing norms, uh, slavery, colonialism, and so forth. Um, Professor Crawford's book is terrific on these um, things, and it certainly influenced my thinking. Um, my book is not mostly about these kind of norm-shifting um, ideas, and maybe Steve will have more to say on those. Um, I think that in my focus on the United Nations, there are norms there, but it's not democratic, that's for sure. Um, it's a, a club of states, and some of them are democracies, some of them aren't. Um, and I see that process, the reciprocity among states who want to be members of a club, who have an identity as I'm a state, therefore I'm in the UN, therefore I've got the, a flag and an anthem and this charter that I'm supposed to follow or not get caught um, breaking and so forth. Um, and to my view, that's primary here. The idea that people are becoming more uh, empowered vis-a-vis -vis their governments, I think it also has a role, but as you can see, I'm a little fuzzier about what that role is, and you're going to um, later explain to me you know, where my thinking is lacking on there. Um, I see that it's not the whole explanation because we're making a lot of progress even while democracy sort of goes up and down. And I think the Occupy movement is probably not the right case to be looking at. It's more the Syrian opposition, and what do you do when co confronted with violence? I don't have a good answer to that. Um, I was inspired by the whole Arab Spring, you know, nonviolence, especially when it was having more success last year, um, that this was part of a, a trend away from violence and war. Um, right now, it's not quite so clear because of Syria whether that can be sustained. Steve, you want to jump in? No, or, I, well, two Steves. <laughs> yeah. Probably both of you. And the difference between the two of you and Bill on Nita's question, 
because Joshua, you've been very careful. Not to, you know, I'm not an optimist. It's very conditional. And Steve's book has more of a built-in optimism. Um, and it's based, I think, on your faith in sort of the power of reason and deliberation and open discourse. And there is a sort of embedded teleology there that in fits and starts, we are groping our way towards better understandings of how to interact together. And that if we have open discourse and democratic deliberation, we don't always get it right, but we get it right more often than we get it wrong. And therefore, mankind will, in fact, be in better shape in the 22nd century than it was in the 20th. Uh, and you're not making that claim. You're, you're, so can I get an argument going between the two of you <laughs> and thereby demonstrate the irresolvability of conflict? No. Anyway. See what you've started, Nita? <laughs> but I'm outnumbered, because the two of them are in much better so, agreement than, than we I, I do think that that's a, a profound point in that once, once you have the ground rules for open debate and deliberation in place, I do think the discussion is going to move in certain directions. And it's because of the game theoretic structure of violence that violence really is stupid to the extent that both sides can sit down and figure out how to run their, their affairs. Uh, and so that the whatever directionality there is, and I don't believe in any mystical forces that are bringing us ever uh, outward, but just as there's nothing mystical in saying that science on average advances, medicine on average advances, people live longer, uh, and so on, there's nothing mystical in saying that as we get to hash out uh, how we ought to live our affairs, more, more and more with lots of you know, reversals and lurches, it will be in the direction of less violence, because violence really is, by definition, just destructive. Uh, on the other hand, those ground rules have to be in place. And I think, I take it that one of the uh, essences of democracy that you've identified is not so much you know, majority rules, but rather you don't get to murder people who disagree with you. Uh, and I think that really is the key to democracy. And I think that it plays a, a role in peace uh, above and beyond the, the, the Kantian idea that if you're if you have cooperative dispute resolutions within your borders, you're more likely to externalize them. And that, that may or may not be true. But in addition to whatever effect that does, uh, there are, I, I discuss a number of models that speak to uh, Monica's question of how did Hitler uh, succeed? Granted that he had whatever pathologies he had, how did he get the entire country to go along with him? One of the answers, it seems to be that if you, if you get to murder people who disagree with you, um, then a, there are a number of models from Michael Macy showing that a fanatical minority can intimidate a huge minority into acquiescence if they have the ability to intimidate uh, through violence at will, uh, which also uh, speaks to the question of what could go wrong. Well, in any society in which a minority gets to intimidate its opponents by force, and maybe Syria is another example, then, then there can be a lot of very bad outcomes. And to the extent that democracies prevent that from happening, they're less likely to go in fanatically destructive directions. Let's go to the left, pal. Hi, I'm a sophomore at the college. And I was uh, hoping you could sort of speak more about to what extent is this soft leviathan, this trend towards democracy, conciliation, threat for borders, um, you know, a call towards more um, civility towards each other is actually causing us to refrain from clamping down on violence when it does emerge, such as in Syria, such as in Libya, um, and really uh, you know, preventing us from dealing with those uh, spurts of conflict when they do arise. I thought that the intervention in Libya was quite successful and partly because we had the UN Security Council on board, and maybe we pushed you know, beyond what was really certain members of the council intended, but they probably should have known that was gonna happen. Um, Syria, we don't have that. That's a huge difference. And uh, I mean, I heard Anne Marie Slaughter on the radio today saying maybe we should do it Kosovo style and go in if it gets past a certain point. I'm very leery of that. Um, Getting back to, if I could, to this point about um, you know, democracy and all that, and I think that there is a, a difference here um, with Steve and I, that I'm looking at the United Nations. I, I'm a, I have a realist streak here for such a liberal internationalist, and the streak is that 
the, the members of the UN are states, and what they do internally is not the big predictor of, of what happens externally. What they do with each other, between each other, and here I'm the liberal internationalist, that is, that is the big predictor. Um, and so the beauty of the UN is getting everybody into this club, agreeing to some rules, and then incrementally over time following them better. Um, I do think it helps. I'm all for democracy for other reasons, but it bleeds off into a whole series of issues about having a more just society, um, and these are issues in, in those cases too. Um, do you need to have economic equality? Do you need to have the empowerment of minority groups, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? All of which goes in the catchphrase, if you want peace, work for justice, which everybody seems to agree on, except I don't think so. Um, that's putting peace at the end of the long line of intractable social problems. So I say if you want peace, work for peace, and that's more like what the UN is doing. Um, these other things, the democracy, justice, and so forth, are all a little more indirect, and it's not that they don't contribute, but I don't take that long detour to the extent that we can go straight to the outcome that we want. Now we're approaching the witching hour, and I'm gonna do something a little different which is I'm gonna ask these three people who've been so patient to each ask a question, quick, short question, we'll cluster them and that way you'll, everybody will have had a shot before we disperse. So in the balcony. My name is Peter Grogan, I'm a freshman at the college. My question is for Professor Walt. Uh, I know you teach a course called The Origins of Modern War, so we've heard a lot on the, from the left side of the table about why war might be on its way out. But I was hoping you could uh, elaborate on some of your points on why modern wars might still happen. Yes. Actually, my question is also for Professor Toft. It seemed to me that the role of religion was not emphasized enough in this discussion. And while I would like to believe with Professor Pinker that human nature is becoming better, when I was young, I used to think that was going to happen too. I've gotten old and I, I dispi uh, dispel of that. Maybe the uh, great, greatest civility is just the lack of religiousness in Europe. And we don't we have to worry about the hundreds of millions of people whose religion teaches jihad as leading to a major war? And the first question that was asked wasn't really answered. Is 60 years data statistically significant against these thousands? Could you not see a dip in 60 years that really means nothing about the fundamental nature of the human being? Hi, my name is Aysana Molina, I'm from Brazil, from Fluminense Federal University. Uh, what can be the Brazil role in the world's conflicts, or Brazil is limited only to be a player in South America? I could, I did, Josh didn't, Joshua didn't quite catch your question. Ask the last part just again. Uh, the, Brazil have a, a role in the world's conflict, or is limited to be a player only in South America? Okay, what we're gonna do is now go down the line, starting with Steve Walt, to Monica, to Steve Pinker, to Joshua, and that's it. Yeah, I took the question to be what could still cause wars to happen in the future. Uh, let me just remind everybody that the United States has fought four wars in the last 20 years, twice against Iraq, in Kosovo, and in Afghanistan. Um, so one of the things that makes countries fight and will continue to make countries fight is fear, and especially that very toxic combination of fear and overconfidence, the sort of schizophrenia of thinking that your situation now is bad, maybe getting worse, but there's a way to fix it uh, by deploying military force. If you think about the way the United States thought in the year or two before we invaded Iraq in 2003, we were very worried, very scared about what might be happening around the world, very confident in our ability to defeat Iraq, Right? and believing that, of course, that would produce lots of benefits. We ended up being wrong about everything except the ease of defeating Saddam Hussein's army, but it's the kind of circumstance that can certainly lead to war. And that, by the way, dovetails with the idea about uh, democratic debates. I am not as convinced that democracies debate these issues particularly well, and part of my evidence for that is looking at the abysmal way the United States debated its decision where virtually everybody in Congress, including most senior members of the current administration, ultimately supported the war, not because they thought it was a good idea necessarily, but because it was politically expedient to do so. Right. Monica? Uh, 
Yeah, so religion hasn't come up, and I don't want to implicate religion. Uh, the characters, of, I study civil wars largely in revolutions, and it turns out that actually religion is more implicated in modern civil wars starting about the 1970s. However, um, so is nationalism. So when people say that borders are pretty robust, it drives me crazy because since 1945, in the 1940s, there were about 40 states. How many states do we have today? Upwards of 190. That, to me, does not seem like really stable borders. We've had a proliferation of states and secessionist movements, and some of them are driven by nationalism. Some of them are dri driven by religious minorities. Um, but also, religion has brought about peace. So, so Joshua has done a terrific job talking about the UN, which I actually question how successful the UN has been. The UN usually comes in after the parties have agreed they're going to end the fighting, and then sort of rubber stamps it. This is what happened in El Salvador, which is held up as this great case. But the FLMLN actually presented accords to the government, and then the UN came in and helped to sort of set a timeline and make sure that both parties settled the peace. In Mozambique, it was the Society of San Egidio, a Catholic lay organization that sued for peace for both sides, had been embedded in this society. And then also, um, if you look at South Sudan, it was Senator Dan Danforth. And why he was able to do this is he's a minister. And he was trusted by both the Christian, largely Christian South. I, very hesitate, I hesitate to use that. It was largely a southern Sudan going up against sort of an Islamicizing north. So the fact that they weren't Muslim was the problem, not that they were Christian. But it was, again, it was a religious figure that caught, came and brought peace. So I don't want to really implicate religion. It's a kind of a complicated picture. So one is, is um, I'm, I'm, one of the things that I look at is actually domestic politics within states and sort of returning to democratization. Uh, the, the biggest problem, and I think both of you allude to this in your books, is actually these transitions to democracy. It's that deliberative process. And the problem is there are many societies, the other side is still willing to kill. And so it's that moving toward greater democratization. There are a lot of countries in the world that are still not democratic uh, and highly autocratic. And so we do have some work to, to do. And so we have this dilemma as we push forward this democratization agenda that there's going to be paroxysms of violence that result from it, which have been you know, the most common form of violence since the 1970s. Stephen? Uh, <coughs> Let me ask you two questions. On, on uh, religion, I quote from uh, Matthew White, a man who calls himself an atrocitologist and a necrometrician, uh, who uh, was asked, I wonder how much of the world's uh, suffering and atrocities have been caused by religion. And he said 11%. Uh, <laughs> uh, a, somewhat facetious, uh, a somewhat facetious, but probably not entirely uh, an accurate estimate, in the sense that it is far greater than zero, but certainly not the only cause of uh, world conflict. The thing about religion, of course, and as, and as Monica pointed out, is that religion itself is not a fixed target. Religions themselves change over time. There's a lot of diversity. There's a, a general trend in, in the West for religions not necessarily to disappear, but to become less uh, militant and more uh, ecumenical. Whether that will happen in the Islamic world, I don't think any of us really knows. Uh, in terms of uh, the, whether the last 66 years statistical fluke, uh, the answer is no. That by any estimate of the rate of wars, great power wars, Western European wars, wars across the world over a preceding period of time, if you ask what's the probability that we could have had the number of wars that we've had in the last 66 years or fewer if the odds had stayed the same, it's astronomically small. So it's, it's not a statistical anomaly. There really has been an underlying change in the probabilities. Joshua? Yes. Uh, Brazil, I think, is a rising power that's playing more of a role in the world and aspires to do so. And I think that's a good thing, especially as the biggest uh, country in the most peaceful region that's really been had quite a stable peace, South America. The particular effort they made with Iran I may have been a little bit off target. But I think the general idea of playing that kind of role, getting onto the Security Council more often than some other countries. and trying to work with the BRIC countries um, is a good trend in the world. Um, Steve Walt, in talking about the problems of the debate leading up to the Iraq war, was too modest because you uh, signed that newspaper ad that invading Iraq is not in the national interest, and you got it completely right. Um, so unlike and, and, and we had enormous impact in stopping yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> about the impact that we're having on convincing people that there aren't more wars. Um, the questions of borders and the United Nations, um, 
Yes, there were a lot of border changes after World War II. That's not what I'm talking about. But when was the last time that a country changed borders by force successfully? And compare that to the number of border disputes that are now being resolved through the world court, which is actually a, a sizable and growing number. Um, it's just not happening anymore that you take a border dispute and you go straight to war and, and take the territory. So you've got sort of ethnic minorities or ethnic majorities or right. religious minorities challenging states themselves. And if the state doesn't play along, then they sort of decide, okay, we're going to possibly use force. In some cases, they take it to the courts. But in a lot of cases, they don't. Right. So I'm talking about the interstate borders and especially in Africa where they're so crazy but, and yet nobody wants to mess with them. Um, the United Nations, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, it was one UN member invading another one and annexing it and putting it out of business. Now, I ask you this, how many, since the founding of the UN, how many UN members have gone out of business by being conquered or through violence? And the answer is none. That's an astounding record and it tells you why states really want to get into the UN. Um, you know, when you, when, you, when you become a new state, like Bosnia. Bosnia probably, arguably, would not be in existence today if they hadn't gotten into the UN. Once you get into the UN, then there are some guarantees that come with it. Finally, um, I, you know, thinking about how hard it is to make this case and be taken seriously about it, sometimes I think about the people who lived in the time of Copernicus and Galileo. All their life, and of course, we're, I don't want to you know, be that grandiose about it. This is a micro version. Nonetheless, all their lives, they wake up every day, they're on firm ground, the earth, and they see all these things rotating around them, right? Every day, just like we, every day for our whole lives, wake up, read the newspaper, turn on the TV, and we see there's all these wars everywhere. So, you know, I think that we, they call us the contrarians on the Talk of the Nation show, you know, the, we're contrarians, we're, we're scientists, and we have taken the data, the evidence, and come to this conclusion that actually things are not getting worse. The world is not going to hell in a handbasket. And it's the hardest thing to convince anybody because you just turn on the television, and, you know, in the first page of my book, I say, to understand this, you probably need a broken TV set. And now I'm, <laughs> now I'm thinking, why didn't they put me on all those TV shows? You know? <laughs> I was like, it's, it's just out of paradigm. And yet, um, that's where the evidence is going to lead you if, you if you really stick with it. Well, we may not have solved the problem of war, but uh, I hope that uh, we've at least intrigued you enough that there, you realize there's something there to follow up, to learn more about. And I do heartily recommend these two books as the place to start. But before that, I'd like to ask you to all join me in thanking us. Hold on. Good job. Very good.